but there you, go. you just unmute me. Yeah. I don't know which one I should be shot, you know. My voice is, I need like this. Are we ready? Yes, we are. So we want to invite you guys to come a bit closer. It's a very big room for people that are uh, online. They don't see it. That's good. It's a big room and I will please come closer. This is, a, this is a session that has created a lot of uh, attention and awareness in the HISP um, groups. Uh, because after the, during the pandemic, we really saw the importance and strength of uh, sharing data across sectors. Um, and um, I also think government had a kind of a, um, an awareness of how to use DHS2 for more than health. Because during the pandemic, we were, of course, having integration with immigration authorities, civil registries, uh, IC bed tracking, tourism, etc. And then after the pandemic, we have seen a um, uh, uh, demand and an interest in also to look into to, to all of the sectors, how we can benefit of the sharing data across for analytics and for strengthening national, but also local government. So if we are we are actually talking about the SDGs. And remember this morning, we were talking about climate health. The SDGs are covering 17 different sectors, and many of which are environmental oriented. And the aim of the SDGs is to address poverty, to address uh, a better planet. And we are halfway to 2030. So there is kind of a, a time and a, a, um, a time for action and a time for being able to utilize the opportunity that are in the countries to get more awareness about monitoring SDGs across sectors and also utilize it in different ways. So we will today, this last session of the day, before the technical sessions uh, afterwards, uh, we will go through uh, four different examples. We will, we will hear from Uganda, we will hear from Rwanda, we will hear from Ethiopia, and then we will have a, a virtual presentation towards the end. So, uh, Prosper, will you introduce our first speaker? That will be virtual, but uh, we will... Uh, Prosper is from his program as well, so he will be able also to, to uh, join the discussion if that's possible, necessary, okay? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christine. Uh, welcome to this session, very exciting session after discussing the digital public goods. And uh, these are really examples and uh, some of the use cases that we are already starting to see as uh, we, we go beyond um, uh, health. Yeah, so we are excited to be sharing today um, uh, one of the big use cases that we, we have in Uganda, uh, a use case that is really not bringing one sector to the DHIS2, but multiple sectors. And we are very excited to have um, uh, a presentation from the government, um, uh, from Mr. Luas Robert, who is the principal uh, information systems specialist uh, on, at, the, at the office of the Prime Minister in Uganda, who has been very key in trying to design this implementation and roll it out. So we'll just take it through um, to him. Uh, he's presenting live um, uh, visa issues again. Uh, he will be presenting live uh, from, from Kampala. Um, uh, and again, it's uh, after, almost after work in Uganda. So we again uh, want to apologize for taking your you know, after work, uh, work. So um, let's get to um, to you, Robert. Are you there? And uh, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Help us to get back, Robert. Back on. Oh. <laughs> But if we have any connection problem, we can be flexible that we all regard. We can we can start with the with the Rwanda if we are not able to solve it in a and couple of days. We just 
So he's not on the settlement. So okay. he's disappeared. So I don't know where he is. So I can't. Do... Mm -hmm. No sharing. No, he's gone. Okay. okay. So maybe we'll stick with one and then we shall probably come to to yeah. his when we come. Okay. Summer and that's fine for you, right? Then we just start with the one, no problem. Okay. You on the spot. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. So um for the for the Rwanda cross sector monitor, are we together? Hello. Ah, oh, very good, very good, very good. <laughs> So for the Rwanda um, uh, cross sector monitoring tool, um, actually, um, this is another tool that we've been developing actually to uh, to track uh, the cross sector indicators. This one is different from the health sector one because the health sector is only health, but this one is collecting almost all sectors indicators. So um, maybe given the background, these are the pictures. I wanted you to show you how these cross sector indicators are really published currently. Most of these. Yeah, okay. Um, most of these cross sector indicators, they are published uh, manually. You know what happens? We just print, we print them and put them on the dashboard. We call it. Uh, uh, citizen public data portal, but it's a money one. They just print and post it somewhere in the public place where people come and check the performance of the of the of the, of the local entity. Uh, now what we are doing is just to automate the whole process. So you can see different dashboards, standings at the district. It's in Kinyarwanda. You will bear with me. Uh, then this is another example of. Uh, Sorry, I have to uh, click in. Sorry. So this is another example of uh, the, what we call the situation room. The situation room actually currently how it works. Uh, it's, a, it's a room where they track all the performance of these indicators that comes from different sectors, which is health, education, um, uh, social protection, gender, and others. But uh, the way they really update the situation room is that they write manually. There is a board, there is like a paper there, you go and write 10, 30 manually. So we thought that automating the whole process will help us also to come up with an automated dashboard that will help uh, these people to take decisions and, and other actions. So why should we care about the monitoring tool that is capable to really automate the whole process, as I said. You know, this KPI, which is Key Performance Indicator, they are led by the Ministry of Local Government. It's not Ministry of Health, because Ministry of Local Government is the one that is in charge of the whole uh, local administrative entities. Then again, what I could say here is that as you go down at the grassroots, they don't, they don't care about health only. They care about the citizens and the other uh, services, which is either health, education, and others. So the, we, we, we are expecting that the system will be able to help them when it comes to data triangulation. I mean, triangulating data across the sectors in a in in simple, simple way. Then it will help us to have these dashboards. As you have, you have seen, they write the dashboard using their pens and hands. Then again, of course, we'll be able to monitor the performance of these indicators across uh, the sectors and levels, different levels. So, as I said, uh, you know, the uniqueness of this project is that it will be really implemented at the grassroots level, which is the cell. Uh, the cell, actually, for us, we have district sectors and cells. So, this data will be collected at the cell level. Uh, but again, we have also the situation report that is collected at the village level because they will be using mobile phones. Then we will try to come up. We have tried to come up with the thematic data entry forms, but again, also 
uh, phonetic uh, dashboards. So uh, actually the difference between the traditional reporting that we are having currently and uh, the automated that we are really implementing currently is that uh, at least having the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the one data bank will help us to have some algorithm that are able to detect earlier where we're not performing well. Then again, it will simplify the process of reporting. Uh, it will improve the quality of data. Then again, the dashboards, of course, will be also automated. So these are expected outcomes that we're expecting to gain from the, this tool. Uh, one is that uh, we will have a, a greater visibility of what is happening at the ground level, which, which is currently done through either WhatsApp or through email and the manual papers. It's not easy to aggregate and be able to see what is happening down. Again, it will enhance the decision-making capabilities at all levels. It will increase accountability. Of course, if you are having a visibility, you are able to ask why things are not going uh, based on the investment that you are putting on. Then, uh, of course, the, 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 main, um, the main reason why we're implementing the tool is not accountability only, is also continuous improvement. We are seeing that we have committed to reach at this number after three months, but in one month, we are seeing that we are not, will not be meeting our target. Then again, aligning with the goals. When I, uh, we say goals, we have many goals. We have different goals. There's SDGs, there's national commitments and others. All these indicators are converged on the national commitments, SDGs and others. So um, as I said, we are, we are, we are happy that uh, DHS2 currently supports different uh, devices. Uh, for the, at the village level, we are planning to use the normal phones, which is the, the government have offered the Android phone to the head of the village. So we are planning to use them, but uh, at the other levels, we'll be using laptops and tablets. So we'll not read the rest of those others. So these are the sectors. The indicators are really aligned to these sectors, different sectors. We have agriculture, we have education, we have energy, we have environment and natural resources, gender and family promotion, governance and decentralization, health, ICT, justice. So actually, when we say health on this side, it means a lot. It means all these sectors because, you know, for you to prevent yourself from infectious disease, you need to have knowledge. For you to attend the antenatal care, you need to be aware that it's really important for your, for your baby. So all of these sectors, when they are combined together, that's when we call it health, by the way. Okay, so these are the districts we have in Rwanda. We have five provinces, districts, there are 30, sectors 416. Then cells, there are 2,100. Prosper, you are laughing. Small. No, no, it's not small. <laughs> but, <laughs> then we have these villages. Yeah. yeah, actually, these, these are the administrative hierarchy. On top, we have provinces. It's like region. Some countries, they have region. Others, they have states. So for us, we have province. We have five provinces. Under the province, we have districts. Then under the district, we have sectors. Then under sectors, we have cells. Those are the structure. So for the for this initiative, will be the reporting will be at the level of the cells, then also at the level of the village. Yeah. So those are the numbers of village and cells. So of course, uh, uh, implementing this initiative was not easy because you know um, looking at uh, reality from the ground you find that each district will always have their different interventions. Like uh, the KPI, we have what we call Imigo. Normally in Rwanda, all of us, we have KPI. Like me, I have KPI, district, we have KPIs, the ministry have the KPIs. So those KPIs, you sign, we sign them with your supervisor. Like if it's the minister, they sign it with the president, even the district, they sign with the president. So those are the KPIs that the means of, finance will invest in. So when they're investing in, it means if you go down and you start uh, 
uh, linking them with interventions. Those different interventions are the ones that we end up coming up with different indicators. So which means one district may have uh, 10 indicators that are different from another district based on the intervention that they think will really uh, push them to meet the commitment that they signed. So one district may have a priority of building roads, another one the priority will not, building, will not be building road. Maybe previous year they built roads, this year they're not going to, to have building roads at their, their, their purity. That's why we started with the assessment to ensure that we are able uh, to know what is available, what are, what are interventions that they have, what are the key indicators, then we redefine them. Uh, what, our assessment, what we have seen in assessment, we found that most of them, they have different indicators. Then we started the customization, the customization to the system. Uh, we did the testing, but again, the testing was different from different uh, regions. So as I was saying, we started with the uh, Eastern province. This is the Eastern province where we were piloting. That was uh, our, our plan to start and pilot here, but previously it changed. The government said, no, we don't want you to pilot in one, just go to all provinces. So currently we are doing the same exercise to all provinces to come up with one harmonized reporting, which have different indicators, but maybe in the future they will be harmonized. So that is what we are doing. Uh, very soon we'll be launching countrywide. So these are different packages that we devote. There's a what we call situation report. There's a KPI, performance indicators. There's also in the reporting, which is reported in different. There's one in daily basis. There's another one on quarterly and monthly. So this is an example of what we customized. You can see uh, uh, these are different forms that has agricultural environment. These are section forms that have different reporting uh, forms. This is a KPI that is reported by district and sector. This is what we call IMHIGO, the one that we sign, or that the district and the ministry sign with the, government, with the, the president. So these are also the IMHIGO. This is the situation report. Actually, in, in the beginning when we were customizing the system, the situation report was not part of overall projects. But when we were customizing, um, the governor and the ministers were saying, no, 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 we need to know what is happening real time. So use the system to really notify us what is happening. So we, we created uh, the all oh, You you are from East Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> so we created the situation reports to ensure that at least we are able to respond to the needs because you know it's not all about reporting the quarterly, but also the real time data. Uh, so the next steps, actually, after changing the plan, because the plan was piloting in the Eastern province, currently what we're doing is customizing the, ensuring that uh, the system is, is able to generate the standard reports. Then they were re requesting us to have like a, a approval process. We are lucky that the DHS, actually the DHS still, uh, actually we have to appreciate the, the, the developers. We lucky that this feature was already there, but they think we are, we are developing it. <laughs> they now think that I'm here developing it. So when we go back, we just implement and they think we have developed it. So we will conduct the training uh, for all of them to ensure that they, they have skills on using all these features. Then of course, we have to, we, we've been reviewing the metadata because some of, most of them, they are different. Actually, it's, 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 it's it you have some complexity on implementing a, such a system that doesn't have the harmonized indicators. Of course, we will be supporting users on a daily basis. So uh, these are the challenges, but uh, they are not big challenges as such. The, the most challenge is indicators because indicators are different in all the sectors or all district, sorry. So you find they have different interventions, so at the end of the day, they will have different indicators. So harmonization is not easy. Then we are requested to, to make the system talking to other systems. We have to map them. Then the data entry, of course, because the data entry was not designed for KPI. We are thinking to add some of the, because you know, for them, they want to see the baseline, the, the actual status, then the, 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 the target. 
Yeah, these are the solutions, but you can read them. I think we are showing challenges, but also the solution. Thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Raise my body to stop you. <laughs> so uh, I think we save the question for later. So we make sure that we're now getting uh, uh, the ministry in from from Kampala. Okay. Are they, are okay. they there? Yeah. Um, uh, we have the slides. Robert, can can you share your screen then? Yeah. Are there? Okay. Oh, yes. good, good, good. Okay. So you can put in the presentation, but just um, uh, to recognize again, um, uh, Robert uh, Rwasa, who is the principal ad systems administrator in the office of the Prime Minister of Uganda, and is actually also joined by colleagues also from the same office. Um, uh, that is a uh, uh, Leonard Taroma, who is also the monitoring and evaluation of visa, uh, and these two have been very key in this implementation. So we're going to switch over to Kampala and uh, get this live presentation from the, the two. Thank you very much. You can go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you very much and greetings to everyone. Uh, as already introduced by Prosper, my name is Robert Ruasa. I'm the principal systems administrator and I double as the head of IT at the Office of the Prime Minister for the Republic of Uganda. So I'm here to share about um, the system that we're implementing, specifically for monitoring the development plan for the country, five year, and uh, it is being developed uh, on, um, on DHI, DHIS2. And this system was actually based on the third development plan which is uh, a framework for the government of Uganda. And it is hinged on the public sector monitoring and evaluation system, which came into force in 2013. Development of this particular tool started in uh, 2020 with support from the European Union. And uh, it has been uh, supported by a consortium, of course, first by the Office of the Prime Minister, where I'm domiciled together with the National Planning Authority, but also with support from COWI in Belgium, HISP Ethiopia, where we had uh, Abiot, and then HISP Uganda, where we have the support of uh, Prosper, Eric, and uh, his co colleagues. So the system was actually developed by the Right Honorable Prime Minister for this Republic in July 20. 21. So it, we are going to be making two years since we launched uh, this uh, particular system. So the system, there is a, a framework of how the M&E is being done uh, in the government of Uganda with uh, His Excellency the President at the top, and uh, he's the chair of the um, cabinet. But uh, the office of the prime minister is uh, the one that is mandated to do monitoring and evaluation in uh, all the government agencies. And uh, beside it, we have uh, the Apex, which is a platform which also does some of the monitoring under the, the presidency, but also the National Planning Authority, which is actually the one that is behind the, the development plan itself. You can see that uh, we have uh, development partners with whom we work, and then we have uh, programs under the different ministries, departments, and agencies all feeding into uh, OPM. Uh, since uh, 2001, we moved away from uh, having sectors doing uh, planning via sectors with a view of trying to avoid operating in silos. So entities that are contributing to particular programs are all grouped together to do the programmatic uh, budgeting. So we have uh, the, the local governments, which are under the Ministry of Local Government. And then we have um, Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. These are the ones that are manage uh, our accounts, the ones that manage our projects. That is where we have the integrated bank of projects domiciled there. 
Then of course we have a Uganda Bureau of Statistics, which is mandated to collect statistics across. So the requirements for the public sector M and E policy included uh, having quarterly reviews by the respective institutions and then uh, by annual internal reviews by the program working groups and then the annual which is conducted again by all the program working groups but we also do performance assessments half year and also for the whole year then there is also fair proportion of public investment projects that are subjected to rigorous evaluations I have already mentioned that we have the integrated bank of projects under the Ministry of Finance, and uh, there is uh, evaluation that goes on from time to time to assess the performance of these uh, respective projects. Then, of course, OPM provides standards and guidance on conducting uh, these evaluations and managing uh, the M&E systems across government. So regarding the design and workflows, the system itself was based on the third national development plan. For the first and second development plans, why we did not have this tool. So to improve, so uh, we, we came up with this tool to be able to help and uh, it's based on the third national development plan, which spans from 2020 stroke 21 and it goes on up to 2024 20, stroke 25. It is also based on uh, program implementation action plans, as well as our bigger vision, that is Uganda Vision 2040. It covers all government ministries, departments, and agencies, as well as the local governments up to the, the, the grassroots. So using uh, DHS, uh, DHIS2, a total of five custom applications that make the system have been done. So one, we have the NDP results dashboard. We also have the, the target data entry. We have the performance, that is the actual data entry. And then we are also able to track actions and policies. Many at times there are some policy resolutions, policy actions that are agreed on, and these need to be tracked. So we also have the NDP document library using the same tool. The scope of uh, this case is um, we have three major reporting frameworks. That is the national development plan. Then we also have uh, the local governments with, with the indicators that are also defined in the NDP. And then we have our flagship, which is the parish development model, because we, we implement interventions up to the smallest level, up to the granular level down at the parish. Then uh, we have cross-sector monitoring at uh, both central and local government levels, where we have, uh, say, ministries, which are a total of around 30 entities. Then we have uh, 122 departments and government agencies. Those are different from the ministries. And then we have local government votes. So these are either ministries or municipalities or cities. Then we also have 20 public sector programs. Remember, I mentioned earlier that initially we were operating sectors, now we are operating programs. So we have 20 programs, under which we have 68 sub-programs. And uh, on the system already, we have over 5,000 indicators that have been defined, and all these are aligned to the different uh, programs in the system. Then the, I've already alluded to the issue of shifting from sector-based to program-based. So we already we are implementing or we have rolled out this system in, uh, say, the Human Capital Development Program. That is where we have ministries like a Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Public Service. Then we have the Development Plan Implementation Program. 
where we have the office of the prime minister itself, we have the national development, uh, or the, the national planning authority, we have the uh, ministry of finance and others, and of course, uh, governance and security, where also office of the prime minister contributes to, because some of the, the, the interventions that we implement fall under the governance and the security program. So our data and level of reporting, we have uh, those uh, three categories. I already mentioned the central government where we have the NDP3 goal, we have the objectives, outcomes, the intermediate outcomes and output results as defined in the plan itself. So we also have the actions, the budgets and releases also defined there. Of course, the, the, there is an integration between say this system and uh, the integrated financial management system to avoid the uh, data entry fatigue. So there is an uh, in, there is interoperability. Also with the integrated bank of, of, uh, of, 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 of projects. We also have uh, project tracking, like I've already alluded to, government implements different programs and there is uh, monitoring and evaluation for purposes of tracking the progress and also the policy action tracking, like I said earlier. Then uh, under the local government um, district level, there we also have outputs defined for each local government and uh, also at the lowest level, that is where we go up to the parish level. Of course, we have received um, uh, we have received requests to drill down up to the village level. So this is something that would probably require more resources to, to be able to, to have the capacity even to collect the data up to that uh, lowest level. So here we have uh, NDP results reporting and visualization. O of course, uh, we, we develop uh, dashboards. Um, like here we have, we are able to have summaries of uh, key result areas defined in the NDP3. We are able to provide the performance figures against budgets. In this lower section, you can see that we have uh, different, um, we have different, say, objectives of the NDP, then the key result area, then the different um, indicators that have been defined. So we set targets and then for the for the respective financial years, we are able to input what have we been able to achieve for the respective indicators. The different color codes depends on the performance. If you have been able say, to achieve the target up to say maybe 95%, then we have a green color code. Then uh, for where we are, we've been able to perform moderately would have to, the color code would be yellow. And then um, where we've underperformed, say under 50%, that is where I would have the red color code to, to be able to show the progress. Then um, of course, I've already alluded to the different indicators where you have different votes, the different ministries, the different entities, which uh, belong to particular or contribute to particular programs, where you are able to have specific indicators, you report on them, and also we are able to compare depending on the baseline that uh, there is for the respective indicators. So I've already mentioned that we have dashboards defined here, depending on what we want to see. The prime minister, by virtue of being the leader of government business, may have may be interested in viewing specific indicators. It could be maybe income per capita. It could be something to do with the poverty levels. It could be something to do with, say, infrastructure. So we are able to filter out depending on the program, depending on the sub-programs or even the respective um, entities that would want to, 
to visualize. But also there is an element of filtering depending on the scope, the period that uh, you want to reference. Of course, there are anal analytics. Now, like uh, say we, we have say NDP results where you have the bigger vision that is vision 2040 targets. And then under that, we have the goal that is as per the NDP three, the objective and the outcome levels as is uh, shown on the left hand side. So here you see we have we have the goals and then the key result areas under which we have the respective indicators. Like you can see, we have the income per capita, we have the real GDP growth rates. And then for each of the financial years, we are able to report on the actual vis-a-vis -vis the, the target. So this goes on. You realize that for the financial year 2023 and 2024, there is no actual because this one is ending at the end of uh, this month, June, then we'll open up and be able to capture what the performance will have been for the respective um, indicators, programs, and MDAs. So this continues, say this is for the policy actions. Remember I said that we have a policy tracker. So a particular vote may have a specific policy that they're supposed to be implementing. So we are able to track. So when is the start date? When is the end date? And what is the progress status? And again, the color coding is, uh, is used to visualize the progress of implementation of the different uh, policy actions. So this is the implementation status of this system, the NDP M and E management information system. So we've been having system improvements and customizations that have been going on because users keep on requesting for different things and then customizing it to make it very usable. So all targets as we speak have been uploaded onto the system as per the third national development plan. And uh, since uh, a midterm review was actually done for the third NDP3, so the results have also been input to the system and uh, performance results for the last two financial years have also been uploaded onto the system. That's why we are able to see for the two financial years, 2021 20, and 21, 22, they are already in the system. So we've been able to put available for the users comprehensive documentation. And at the same time, we have also put in place an instance or a platform to enable users to go in and, um, yes, please. Yeah, um, could you uh, uh, go through quickly the next slide? Uh, we're running out of time. Thank you. Okay, okay. So we've been able to upload manuals to help users be able to have a reference point for support. So we've carried out a series of uh, trainings for purposes of enabling users to be able to navigate the system themselves and be able to report. And uh, we've already rolled out, of course, beginning with ourselves here at the ministry and also the planners in the NPA. And uh, we've also carried out engagement. We've carried out engagements with different uh, players. We have we've been able to do so for the M and E working group, and then the DPI program. So we have initiated because uh, the support that we received from uh, his the, the the contract is ending soon. But we've initiated an MOU to ensure that we have their support as we roll out uh, this, uh, this system and uh, it is pending clearance from the solicitor general. Um, the success factors is a one, of course, buy-in by government and ownership, and of course, high level participation. We have our top leadership that uh, is uh, participating in this. We've uh, recorded success by entities like Ministry of Health, 
they are already implementing other than this there is another system they are implementing on the same platform dhas2 then flexibility of the system to generate user-friendly visualizations to be able to come up with different dashboards and then there are there are a number of uh, government entities that are fully capacitated to access and provide timely reports as well as analysis integration of data co collection has also been able to, to it, it is a success factor that we've been able to leverage on and then the linkage between ndp3 and other government uh, complementary systems like i've already alluded to for interoperability and uh, of course uh, not uh, to downplay the support from the dhis uh, experts from his uganda so we've had uh, challenges of course uh, resource constraints for purposes of rollout because this needs us to go and move from entity to entity we need to move to different districts as we roll this one out and we need resources then the quality of data the data that we have uh, already input for the two financial years has pointed that there are some data gaps so that one is also a challenge and then the difficulty in managing dynamic changes of the indicators as we transition from sector to programmatic budgeting that one has also been a, a very big challenge that we have suffered so i want to thank you for listening thank you so much thank you so much uh, i need to yes. mention that this this work in uganda has actually uh, created a lot of attention for other countries Malawi uh, has been looking into the same solution. I bet you get ready. It's the advert, you know, the same advert that he was thanking for this. <laughs> so you, you should think that it's going to be competitive with life. It's small. I mean, at least we all know each other. Uh, but also, it's also looked into the same solution as this national monitoring, national development plan. And uh, when Albert is, is putting up his slides, we saw the random example is almost the same. However, much more focusing on the local government, strengthening the local government. Here we have the National Development Plan. And I'm very curious to hear what's happening in Ethiopia with the Rural Transformation Plan. Uh, uh, thank you, Christine, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sharing the Ugandan experience with your best planning commission, and I'm looking to uh, look into it. So, yes, it has raised a lot of uh, uh, interest, uh, not only in Uganda, but in Ethiopia, and then, then it kind of uh, continues. But, I mean, the question here is having a kind of a flying figures with the volume is a bit high. I'm not sure what's going on. Having a flying figures with an is not just there we go. Okay. It's not just enough, especially for the uh, local administrative units. Yeah, I mean uh, we, we need to have something similar for other sectors as well. And that, that's what uh, this whole uh, multi-sectoral engagement of uh, Ethiopia is telling us. Uh, it's kind of an aspiration to see a transform in Ethiopia. It's a big initiative by the government of uh, Ethiopia. A uh, strategy to increase the number of high-performing uh, local administrative units. Uh, and of course, it's a vehicle to transform Ethiopia from low to uh, middle income country. Uh, in fact, it's a multi-sectoral engagement of ministries, agencies, uh, development partners, and other stakeholders. We have a number of ministries, uh, Ministry of Health, Education, uh, Agriculture, Transport, and so on. The list kind of uh, continues. Uh, but the word that means it's a local name, it's just a, a district, it's a local administrative unit. And in fact, it's a lost and pragmatic uh, governance uh, unit where a lot of planning, uh, typical classic uh, government activities kind of uh, takes place. Uh, earlier, the, I think our colleague from Ethiopia talked about this uh, one plan, one budget, one report. Uh, this world that transformation is kind of a manifestation of that because everything has to go through that uh, uh, mechanism. 
Yes, I mentioned it's a multi-sex rally engagement, but unfortunately, currently it's only Ministry of Health which kind of uh, leading the pack in implementing this because uh, Ministry of Health uh, has already a system in place. They have been implementing the HRSO since 2017. They have all the experience, and because of that, they were able to kind of uh, implement the water data transformation pretty quickly. What's happening in that is the Ministry of Health have identified five uh, key uh, measurable uh, components or more like pillars of engagement or more like a components. One of the components is quality of service. These are more like the earlier in the Uganda case, we have the 18 or 20 programs. Earlier there were about 18, now currently they are implementing 20 programs. But here we have five pillars and each of them have kind of a number of or a set of indicators. Quality of service, they measure quality of service. Leadership and governance, again, they have a set of indicators to manage this. And also this uh, motivated, compassionate and caring workforce, they also have a set of indicators to measure this. Uh, healthcare financing and of information uh, revolution. All this kind of, uh, uh, in good detail in each of these components, they have a set of indicators. And these are going to be measured against a very specific set of uh, uh, wordas and a total of 65 indicators. As I said, each of them have composite indicators. And in fact, uh, that's where a, a specific or a special app was developed to inside DHIS to, to kind of manage this uh, composite indicator. It's more like indicators inside indicators. And that's just to show you uh, the, the, the app we have inside DHIS too. Uh, this is part of uh, uh, the Warda transformation system. It's an app that was developed by His Ethiopia. And the advantage with this is they are using DHIS2 even to manage this because what's in, what's interesting with DHIS2 is it doesn't dictate you what sort of indicators to collect, report, uh, and process in DHIS2. You as a user are free to, to define, and those come from the five pillars or components. And the advantage is there is already capacity in the country. The system is already operating and functional. So they have already halfway ahead of the pack. That's why the Ministry of Health is uh, already one step ahead of the different ministries. And in fact, they are ready to share that experience. This is just to show you uh, what's going on inside this uh, uh, Warada transformation app. Uh, there are three levels of indicator calculations. It's just a normal indicator at the level one, and these indicators will be calculated against uh, some weight, and then they constitute another set of indicators that's level two, and then you're going to a third level. Again, there is also a different uh, weight uh, because if you take a very specific catchment area, for example, a Wareda, uh, how is just one component of it? There is also education. There are also other sectors. Each of these have their own weights. Again, when you go deep down into the house, we have the five pillars, and each of these have their own weights. And that's where we have these uh, inside indicators, inside indicators, or in general, what we call uh, composite indicators. That's just again to show you how extensive the set of indica the indicators are. Uh, it's quite uh, uh, long. And basically, you have data element and then indicator and then indicator. The, the, the hierarchy is really uh, complex. So that's the, just the word that transformation. But interestingly, as I said earlier, because the HRS has put no limit on what sort of indicators or data you want to collect. And within HMIS itself, they are already collecting data, for example, related to Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, for example, some quintiles of vegetables produced, quintiles of biofortified root growth produced, basically food production in a very specific uh, catchment area. Uh, this one is about uh, Kavale's monthly report. Kavale is basically one level below a uh, district. Similarly, we also have something uh, uh, about uh, uh, Again, another data in terms of agriculture, uh, specific to nutrition. 
uh, household food production, something related to, again, uh, 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 food, agriculture, nutrition, all this, again, part of within the uh, ministry's HMI system. Why? Because there is already the infrastructure, the install was already in place. Again, something similar to just to give you an idea, again, related to uh, nutrition. And in fact, the advantage with this is you can kind of cross, uh, cross analyze together uh, with the malnutrition data you have in the HMIs against the food production you have in the country. And you can see where you have the high food production and you can see whether you have low malnutrition and then kind of say whether you are doing good or bad. Then probably some final words. Again, uh, when you look into this multi-sectoral engagement, uh, having a, a Ministry of Health alone uh, cannot solve the challenge. I mean, it's a multi-sectoral engagement. Others need to come on board. Uh, again, uh, because there is already an existing install bed, there is already DHRS2 in place, and DHRS2 allows you to collect data of your need. You are quite flexible to do that. Uh, we, we need to kind of uh, build into that. Uh, uh, one good example we have here with the case of Ethiopia is Ministry of Health is kind of leading by example. They are sharing their experience. They are sharing their resource. For example, within the HMI, they are also collecting uh, food and production, food and agriculture related data. And they are also guiding uh, other ministries to kind of follow their footsteps. Because often the challenge is for the, the other ministries, Ministry of Health is already doing it. Why not you are not doing it? I mean, that's something that uh, uh, they can't really say no, because the tools are already there. Uh, for example, uh, with the HISP Uganda case, HISP Uganda, the, the local team is already there to support the kind of jump in and then uh, support the office of uh, the prime minister and the national uh, planning authorities. Again, probably this is uh, this final slide is for uh, for us developers. By the way, I have two hats from the HISP Center at the Global as a DHS to developer and also part of the HISP Ethiopia team. This multi sector, uh, multi stakeholder engagement is a new norm uh, for DHS too. And then, we're, technically, we're kind of dealing with layers of items. For example, in the case of Ethiopia, we have composite indicators, indicators inside indicators. That means uh, the usual case of indicator, indicator group, indicator group set is not really enough. We need to step up uh, beyond that and kind of solve into that. And the case where I'm represented, like we have standard data entry app, we only have one column. We don't have this uh, baseline target and actual. For that, we have already an app that we can share with ESP Uganda. But again, uh, we have to kind of make it into the, the global core where it becomes pretty generic. Uh, again, when looking to this, this uh, typical national development uh, programs, uh, national planning, and they're usually uh, a multi-year engagement. And when it comes to DHIS2, the maximum period we have is one year. It's just a year. For example, for Uganda, we have a five year. It could be a three year. So that means, again, we need to do something for the period. But again, also for the indicators, we have 20 programs, and then within the programs, we have sub-program. Within the sub-program, we have objectives, outputs, outcomes, goals. The list kind of, uh, the, the depth kind of goes down. Again, indicator, indicator group, indicator group set, the same as data element, data element group, and data element group set is not enough. Again, this is something for us to take as a homework and then come up with a, a solution. And in fact, my final say is, because this multi-sector, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement is the new norm, uh, there is already an existing installer in the country. Uh, we are a developer, as a developer has to kind of step up and you also have uh, some uh, responsibility, I mean, to solve this as a network. And I would say that's our responsibility to respond to this new emerging challenges to DHIS2. Uh, thank you, that's pretty fast. Running in with so many questions now, but we have one more presentation before we open up for the questions. So please uh, hold on, and then I will call up Alison and read it from Evidence and Research Coordinator at Post Feminista. And then we have questions. Okay, don't leave. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. As Kristen mentioned, my name is Allison Andrade, uh, and I work as the Evidence and Research Coordinator at Fos Feminista. And today I'm going to be sharing a tool we created in DHIS2 called the Advocacy Tracking Tool. And we've developed this tool um, in order to facilitate the meaningful use of advocacy data to support decision making and to promote sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. So to begin, I'll provide some information on who we are. Um, Fos Feminista is a new international feminist alliance formed in 2021, and we work with over 220 organizations, um, local autonomous partners across 40 countries from around the world, and together we um, work to carry out our mission to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care, um, advance comprehensive sexuality education, and to advocate for sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. Uh, we are formed from the merger of three different organizations, International Planned Parenthood Federation of the Western Hemisphere Region, um, International Women's Health Coalition, or IWHC, and CHANGE. And together we have over 70 years of experience um, working to promote the health and rights of women, girls, and gender diverse people. And we also have uh, over 10 years of experience using DHIS2 to help inform our decision making to carry out this mission. So um, advocacy data really spans across sectors. Um, uh, it starts off in the philanthropic sector, goes across the non-governmental and governmental sectors. And the end users of advocacy data um, for our alliance are the advocacy teams of our local autonomous partners in the Global South, as well as the Global Advocacy Unit at Fos Feminista. And these advocacy teams um, advocate with governments in order to pass reform that promotes the sexual and reproductive health and rights um, of women, girls, and gender diverse people. And here you can see a, a timeline. This is an example of what uh, advocacy data could look like. So prior to developing the tool that I'm going to be showing today, um, we would use the capture application and DHIS2 to um, track our advocacy data. We refer to this data as advocacy wins, which we defined as the successful approval or defense of a law policy or protocol um, that can promoted sexual reproductive health and rights and to which our partners contributed. And this data was collected on an annual basis. Uh, and as for analytics, we would create tables like this in event reports and our partners would be able to uh, analyze their data, um, sort these tables by date, um, by other fields. However, um, we received some feedback from our partners that this was not necessarily the most usable format for them because it, it didn't really allow them to track their progress over time. And we know that it can take a long time for advocacy efforts to achieve change. Um, and also it doesn't allow them to assess the impact of advocacy on the lives of people because we know that advocacy doesn't stop when a, a law is passed. It has to be able to make a difference for people on the ground. And so here are a couple of other challenges that we identified with reporting on advocacy in general. Um, first, monitoring and evaluation in advocacy often focuses on data for donors and for international accountability, and it isn't really designed for local advocacy teams in their contexts. 
Um, historically, data capture models have reflected simplistic, narrow logic, where one action directly leads to one outcome. But we know that that's not realistic because advocacy occurs in a complex system, and there are many mediating factors like actions by anti-rights groups or socioeconomic conditions that can influence whether or not um, reform is successful. Tools also tend not to reflect the prolonged process it takes for advocacy to have an effect. And the assessment of impact is often limited to the approval of new policies and laws when we know that there's so much more that needs to happen after um, a law is approved. And so this logic model here um, represents our prior model. Um, we have on the left green representing the inputs of the philanthropic sector and the Fos Feminista Alliance. Um, these include things like human resources, donor funding. In the middle, in pink, we have the activities and outputs of uh, the Fos Feminista Alliance. So activities include uh, capacity bridging, knowledge sharing uh, with outputs, including events, marches, demonstrations, and campaigns. And finally, the long-term outcomes um, for advocacy uh, refer to government reforms. So what makes our, um, our new tool really unique is that um, our model, it takes into account external factors that can influence advocacy, like political, social, economic conditions and actions taken by anti-rights movements and groups. It also considers uh, short-term outcomes, which are things like the introduction of reform, the advancement of reform, and most importantly, it considers impact, the implementation of reforms and how these measures are um, impacting the lives of people. And so with this model in mind, we enlisted the help of KTT, which is a consulting firm that helps NGOs to leverage DHIS2 to improve health outcomes. And so with the help of KTT, we developed our advocacy tracking tool. Um, and this slide shows how some technical information about how this tool was built. It uses a simple structure built in DHIS2 under event program. Um, it's a simple structure of just 12 data elements without registration. Users can view multiple entities simultaneously. Um, data entry is done using a custom form that has dynamic field labels. And finally, it's a custom DHIS2 web app that uses HTML and CSS to display a timeline format to help facilitate analysis. So now I'll walk through some of the most important features of the tool. First, as I mentioned, um, the data is rendered on a timeline, which is something that partners had requested because um, the, it allows them to track their advocacy actions over time. It also allows for robust tracking of contributions and impact with contributions being shown in gray on top of the timeline and impact being shown on the bottom. Um, and unlike impact, which often refers to those short and long-term outcomes, contributions refer more to activities and outputs. So things like campaigns, marches, demonstrations, and it's important to include um, contributions when monitoring our advocacy work because it tells us what works and what is needed for advocacy to be successful. Um, this is the most important feature of the advocacy tracking tool is that it allows um, partners to track their progress according to the incremental stages of reform by policymakers. Um, so as you can see here, we have all the stages color coded. Um, users can check or uncheck the boxes to filter along the timeline. Uh, we also include regression introduced and loss because it's important to learn from our failures, not just our successes, and to account for oppositional forces um, within the ecosystem of advocacy. We also have defended, which refers to when a partner um, successfully contributes to the blocking or a repeal of a regressive measure. And then we have reform introduced, advanced, approved, and implemented, with implemented being 
how was this law or policy translated into practice so that it is it becomes a reality for people on the ground. Uh, our tool also has a flexible data entry form for learning, so partners select an advocacy stage from the drop down menu, and then the questions that appear are tailored to the stage they select and prompts are included to encourage learning and analysis. Uh, data is entered according to need, um, so could be support for people living with HIV, access to contraception, and then people, uh, users can also filter the timeline by need, which um, helps to ensure that uh, decision making based on advocacy data uh, is done with people's needs in mind and is person centered. It also features a multi-year display, which is helpful because advocacy takes place over long periods of time. All of the entries on the timeline are also editable. So users can edit the text, the stage, they can upload images or supporting documentation. And this allows for the app to serve as a dynamic repository of information. There's also an export to PDF option, which is helpful if you want to print out the timeline or um, if you have limited access to internet. Um, and now I'll present a brief use case on the advocacy tracking tool to make it more concrete. Um, this is an example of how um, our partners in Argentina could use the advocacy tracking tool to um, help uh, evaluate their advocacy work as a part of the Green Wave movement, which is the movement um, for safe and legal abortion in Latin America. And so to provide some background information on our partners' advocacy work in Argentina, um, back in 2005 is when they first started taking advocacy actions, um, advocating for access to safe and legal abortion. And so starting in 2005, um, they would submit a bill to the Chamber of Deputies, which is the lower of two houses in Argentina's National Congress. And they would resubmit this bill every two years for the next 13 years, and it continued to fail. But finally, after 13 years in 2018, um, it passed. And while it did not pass through the Senate, the other House of their Congress that year, the fact that it was up for congressional debate and that it did pass through the Chamber of Deputies was a monumental achievement. And so we could track that here on the timeline as um, advanced. It's an advancement um, under June, 2018. Um, and then over the next several years, our partners engaged in different advocacy activities, which we have listed here as contributions. So things like marches, demonstrations that really strengthen the green wave movement. And then finally, in December of 2021, the bill for voluntary abortion was introduced for discussion um, by the Chamber of Deputies. And then in January 2021, um, it passed through the Senate as well. And the national law authorizing access to voluntary interruption of pregnancy was enacted. Um, however, as I mentioned before, we know that advocacy doesn't stop when a law was passed. And so uh, we have created options in the timeline that enable partners to um, track how they're implementing this law and making it a reality for um, people. And so one example of this is that one of our partners made a formal request to the Ministry of Health in their province to have a training on safe abortion care for public health providers. And so um, the Ministry of Health in that province accepted the request and they were able to hold the training, which um, enabled people in that province to um, have the option to access safe and legal abortion and it made it a reality for them. And finally, just to conclude, we have some user feedback on the tool that we've received thus far from um, some validation sessions we've done. Partners have expressed that um, it, it seems like a much needed method of assessing incremental progress in advocacy. They appreciate the flexible rendering in the timeline. Um, they also expressed um, 
their appreciation of the fact that it recognizes that advocacy continues beyond the passage of laws and that positive impact is achieved only when governments create conditions for people to exercise their rights. They also appreciate that it considers the impact of external factors on advocacy work, including adversarial actions taken by anti-rights actors. Um, they liked the ability to include images. They thought that was powerful. Um, and then most importantly, they found that it was a cost-effective and scalable tool for supporting learning and data-informed actions because DHIS2 is a system they already use and are familiar with. And so it would be relatively easy to scale up. Um, so that's all that I have. If you would like to know more about the tool, here's our email address, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is very interesting uh, presentation and a totally different use case for the developers, I have to admit. Uh, but stay on. I think we'll now make a bit of a panel. Come, guys. <laughs> And you are Robert. <laughs> I mean, can also be Robert if Robert still is online. Still online yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But please. So we can pretend a bit of a panel. We can stand because we need to 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 be more energetic. Um, here it is. So, any question from the audience on this kind of uh, new demands for cross sector monitoring? Uh, you know, yeah. We already have one. Super. We need to have more and more mics. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Extremely useful, um, very high potential. And I'm very impressed actually to see the, the brave attempt of going cross sector the cross sectoral analysis. Two questions I have on the frequency of data updates, the data systems for Rwanda. Uganda and Ethiopia. The fact that you are measuring data at a very granular level, the sub-national level, even what is called the cell level. Um, for instance, my education comes from the SDGs. The SDGs are the old 230, say, indicates. I'm just speaking about the global policy instrument level. Um, 80 plus of these indicators come from household surveys. And you know the issues there that we don't have the frequency we want. So just if you can enlighten us about the frequency of, of data updates at that level. And then the example from uh, Feminista, the first feminist, it's incredible. You're actually doing a policy tracing analysis. Uh, this is the Tanahashi model. You have managed to put it in a, you call it a timeline, but you're actually doing a policy analysis along the way. So I think you should document that because countries will eventually want, you are doing it as a global analysis, which is different. But at the country level, we want to see the effectiveness of policies. So you have a very high potential to actually demonstrate that by some comparative analysis, even between two, three countries pivoted in say, um, abortion care or whatever it is that takes your fancy in this but fantastic work thank you so much for the chance to hear it Back to who's you. taking the challenge first i can't take since i have the mic okay. <laughs> no i mean uh, that's a, a good question and uh, it kind of depends on the on the different use cases uh, for example yeah uh, the case with uganda even with ethiopia those the targets they are collected more like on a yearly basis, but then the some of the the actual performances they are on a quarterly basis. But for example, when it comes to Ethiopia, we also have a monthly data, so we have quite a range. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, one of the questions we have, for example, from Uganda was, we don't want to put uh, the targets on a yearly basis. So we we want to put it once for five years. But again. Uh, technically, we don't have a problem, but it's more like uh, uh, how often really we are going to collect that data. So, yeah, it kind of depends from context to context. But technically, we have the solution from because we are using the out of the box DHR solution. It goes from a daily all the way to a yearly. And in fact, uh, as I put on my final slide, we need to go beyond that and come up with a multi year kind of uh, frequency. 
Yeah, I think the same applies to Rwanda. We we have monthly, we have quarterly, and as I said, these are the uh, the, the these indicators comes from the interventions. So it means there are lower level interventions that are turned into indicators that are collected on monthly and quarterly. But again, there's one report I was showing regarding the situation report that is daily. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Daily, yeah. Prosper, any um, comments from your side? Oh, Robert. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I just want to confirm that uh, whereas uh, the demonstration shows that uh, it is annual, but uh, we are able to report quarterly, considering that uh, resources are availed on a quarterly basis, and some uh, interventions are, are implemented only when resources are availed, and that is when you can probably report for them on them. But uh, we can be able to do quarterly, we can be able to do half year, and then annually. Thank you. Any any other questions from the audience? Yes, there is. There is. Hamoud was prom promising to run. I can run. can run. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe a question for all of you, actually. Um, um, how were you able to uh, to decide who are the users or the people that are responsible for gathering this this information? Um, is it the is it the the people that work for different interventions that are responsible for for collecting this data, or is it or do you use protocols uh, that already exist? For example, you know through um, community health visits uh, through an MOH. Um, how was the process, you know, looking like for you to decide what kind of workforce and what kind of users you're going to uh, deploy to be able to collect all this information across sectors? Maybe Robert want to start? Will you, Robert? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can start. Thank you. Yes, uh, each of the entities in the government of Uganda has got um, has got uh, personnel that are responsible for monitoring and evaluation. There are units in every entity that do monitoring and evaluation. So each entity contributes to a particular program and they are in, they are responsible to report on specific indicators depending on the mandate of the respective entities. So that is how we determine which entity, which users report on which specific indicators. So it depends on the entity and uh, which program it belongs to, and then the sector. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's very true, but just to, to add on to that, especially when it comes to this multi-sector, the challenge often is, who is going to see our data? That's because there are multiple stakeholders and, uh, and we are relying very strongly on DHIS's data sharing setting. And the confidence we kind of tell to the users is that, no, oh, you are free to decide on that because DHIS will let you control who can do what in the system. So, uh, yeah, I think we have considered that as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes, we've been talking about, uh, you know, that we, we have used the core DHIS too. So when you look into the system design, like the data, the data sets, they are quite multiple. It's not that it's one data set for everybody. So as he was talking about, you know, it's not one data set that I go and report where I'm, where I'm reporting. So we have this mechanism that you design a data set for each of the, the, the different uh, sectors, and then they are reporting on that. And then you can be able to control the access as, uh, as, as required by the different um, uh, sectors, because some of the data is very sensitive. And so it has to be really shared very well. Which DHS took already provide in terms of access? Any comments from you, Andrew? Yeah, actually, uh, the first pilot uh, from Rwanda on one of the province, Eastern Province, we wanted them to see the data sets, uh, opening the data set for everyone, then you pick your data set, your sector. Then this second revised one, they told us no. You just assign our data set. We don't want others to see our data set. So the new, the new revised 
reporting system, now we are assigning these modules based on the thematic area. It means if you're from agriculture, you only see agriculture related indicators, you will not see health. So that is how we're doing it. At the district level where we have a bigger number of staff, but at the cell level, we have certain number of few staff. It's only one staff that will be reporting to everything. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Aluka from Nigeria. Um, taking the question out of my mouth, but I didn't know that Prosper was going to present something like this today, because yesterday we started the discussion and he said, wait, if you want to know more, you come to the um, presentation. Um, we have a new government in place. And one of the key things that we wanted to do before my coming was to set up an agenda for, we started like a pilot, we call it agenda setting for one of the governors to be able to see how we monitor some of those things. So I think this is a very useful product and uh, we will be getting back to you, especially the assessment that was done in Rwanda and how you are able to conduct indicators upon indicators and be able to come up with something. I think this is a very good, because my question was going to be on the security of it because you know the ministries, they wouldn't want anybody to see their own um, data set or whatever. So you've already clarified that. So I think uh, it's a good product. So I will ask the question again. I want to go to commend the initiative that you have done. And please feel free to let us have an insight into what you are doing so that uh, we can also develop that. Thank you. So this is just an example. Also, uh, I see you. So somebody have to run up there. <laughs> Any volunteers running? Grant is running. So uh, while the Grant is running, um, this is a, just an example also how uh, innovation are shared. You heard uh, uh, Abiyot was involved in the Uganda. Uh, uh, Andrew is whispering in my ear. I will actually borrow that uh, data, you know, capturing tool need to be do, done in the same way. So this kind of sharing of innovations across is actually very, it's the strength of the network. It's not necessarily stemming from the same place, but sharing very, as, of, as, as long as we hear that this uh, is done, then it's shared. So even though Abed was involved in, in many of them, but not in the random one, but of course, sharing solutions. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, my name is Precious Piri from Malawi. This is very interesting. Um, you know, we have this one health approach, one health approach, where we don't look, when we look into epidemics, it's not only one sector like health. You do find also colleagues from agriculture. You know, we have these uh, other zoonotic diseases. So um, you do like also to see or to compare to say, if our colleague in this sector, they are highly performing, there's likelihood of a positive impact to our sector in a reduction. I would give example of labels. You would find if we control in agriculture about animals on labels, obviously it will impact on health when we, it comes to uh, treatment or maybe to give vaccine. And also now we are looking at the other diseases related to food, maybe um, food poisoning, you know, there's also that kind of impact from other sectors. So as you said that uh, when you are presenting, you would allow only maybe one sector to be reflected other than other sectors. But at the local level, earlier level, you would like to support each other to say, look, this is what is happening. But we could also see from our side that as these are increasing or our indicators are not doing very well, there's also an uh, attribution from our sector. So now how do we balance this so that we can have like a joint approach to some of these epidemic control? given that he is only one in our sector looking at those indicators. Thank you. Anyone volunteer for this one? Is yeah, it yeah. a question or a comment? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, uh, I mean, it was, I think, uh, almost a, a comment, but uh, 
Yeah, but I, I think it's uh, more of a question in terms of, you know, how you bring, I mean, we're talking about the, the data sharing and what, and I think you are trying to say, to say that there is, I mean, we, we don't need to limit the data sharing because this the analysis really needs to, uh, to, to appear at the lower level. I, I think it will depend on uh, each country, you know, data sharing policies and guidelines. Uh, this will find that, you know, in some countries, um, uh, the data sharing across sectors is quite limited, and however much the system can support it, the policies and the and the workflows don't uh, uh, don't apply. But it's it's been very interesting when it comes to you know the cross sector, uh, especially when it's government led, as a, as a Mr. Russell was sharing here, is. Um, there is a level where they want to see data across all these sectors and they have been doing it only that they have not been having a platform that is easily accessible by the different uh, um, sectors. But here DHIS2 is allowing them to be able to go online and probably look at the sectors. And that's something that we need to deal with in terms of you know, access because accessing it in a book, in a printed material is different from the online. So that, that's, that, that's where we are going. But um, it's very exciting that you know governments really want to share uh, the data across, uh, apart maybe from the finance where you know it may be a little bit tricky. But when it comes to the one health, when it comes to related sectors, I think this is what is being promoted, and that's what DHIS is clearly bringing up out. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a quick question to Alison. So uh, the thing is now. I think uh, Amani from WHO Sierra also highlighted while we are doing especially this cross-sector things and monitoring. And now the next requirement is for us to visualize and timeline visualization, mind you, like has been a really good tool, especially when, especially like when we wanted to uh, do even research publications during COVID pandemic, we always wanted to show how things were progressing, right? So uh, with all that, like, uh, and also like the pre in the previous presentation, uh, previous session, we were discussing about DHS2 as a core and the extensions. Uh, you don't have to answer it uh, just now, but like, have you considered uh, making this app that you have uh, created maybe open source or kind of making it more generic so that others can really utilize this uh, timeline visualizations? <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So I think that is ultimately the hope. However, um, it's still in its very early stages. And so we still have to iron out the bugs and make sure that it's ready to share. We have to pilot it and everything, but um, definitely feel free to email us for more information. And our hope is that one day, once it's ready, we'll be able to share it with everyone. Thank you. Time is up. If there is no more uh, questions from the audience or from the panel, the distinguished panel, any last comment from you guys? I mean, this is actually something that I think uh, we think will be, you know, uh, an increasing demand in the future because you can hear that how the word is spread through countries when it's when you see it's possible to 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 do this. Uh, um, cross-sector monitoring of progress, SDGs, KPIs. Prosper, you have a last comment? Yeah, um, the, 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 the last comment I have is, uh, as, as we implement, um, I think this is a sector where the investors have not been coming on the table. So uh, it's it's quite challenging for us to be able to attract more funding to support this. Uh, we need investors in this. Uh, Mr. Wasa said that you know, like you know, the government also need support to be to roll out these systems and implement. But one um, one important lesson that we have learned, and I think already we are seeing in Uganda, is that once this cross sector. Um, uh, implementation comes across, it also attracts other sectors to take on their own systems. So like we're talking about the health, now the education. So other sectors are going to be coming and they want their internal systems to, to be on DHIS2 so that they can be able to push data directly into uh, the DHIS2. Today we've been talking about with the commissioner of, of, of health who is responsible for reporting into the this OPM system. And they're saying now, why should we be now double entering? We just need to connect our DHIS for health to automatically push data into the into the uh, the the the, M &E, the the NDP monitoring system. So we see a lot of, of potentials for you know these kinds of collaborations, and you know other sectors also taking up their own uh, systems. Thank you.
And another, uh, you mentioned it, agriculture. I think uh, another up and coming uh, uh, sector that is uh, utilizing DHS2 and for uh, data serverless is agriculture. And we have examples from Malawi, uh, as you mentioned, and uh, we have heard it was this uh, presented uh, last year in the in the annual conference, and we will present this year as well. I think. Okay, thank you so much for talking of which. So thank you everyone for attending this uh, to be continued discussion. We will have a plenary where we continue this discussion on Thursday morning. So prosper. Uh, and, let's, uh, Okay, we are finished. Yeah, this is finished now. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that's the end of the parallel sessions for today. Um, I think there are now just expert lounge sessions out in the uh, hall, and uh, we're going to try and capture some interviews with people as well. So, if you would like to tell us uh, what DHIS two means to you, we'll be outside in the courtyard in five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, for everyone online, uh, that's the end of the session uh, and the end of the day. So we'll see you all tomorrow, bright and early. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. No, I. Uh... What the hell is doing until two tomorrow? We're trying to switch the game yet a little bit around. But I'm sure I can help. Yeah, so what you need to do is. Uh,